Okay, so so welcome. <laughs> this presentation is the Turtles of Virginia. Um, it's held in conjunction with Delray Artisans, the Naked and the Newt exhibit. That exhibit ran the um, the full month of June. It is coming down tomorrow. You can still catch it tomorrow from 12 to 4, and we're open until 8 p.m. tonight. Um, you'll also be able to see it online. So if you go to Delray Artisans' website, um, you'll probably, let's see, until tomorrow, you'll see it on the homepage and on the exhibits page here, the Naked and the Newt. But once it, the exhibit's over, you'll be able to find it in the archives. And you would scroll down to the Naked and the Newt and click on it here. And we have some um, um, of the exhibit is, is online. So you can view the online album to see what it looks like in the gallery, as well as some of the individual artworks. Um, Delray Artisans is a nonprofit. Uh, we, um, we appreciate your support. If you'd like to, to give a donation from our website, you can go to support us, donate. Um, this exhibit is also sponsored by the Virginia Herpetological Society. And so from their website, the links are in the chat, but from their website, you would go to their membership page and then you would scroll down all the way down, learn all about the membership. It's a great group. And then you would see their donate option down here. Okay, so I think that's most of the business side of things. Um, we are welcoming tonight um, J.D. Klepfer. He is the state herpetologist of Virginia, and we are excited to learn all about the 22 species of turtle inhabiting Virginia. And I will turn this over to J.D. My name is J.D. Klepfer. I'm a state herpetologist. Um, so I was asked to do this presentation on turtles, and it's a pretty big topic, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. I, I, uh, did my undergraduate and graduate work at Christopher Newport University, and I did my master's thesis actually studying turtles in southeastern Virginia. So with this presentation, I thought I'd talk a little bit, um, kind of introduce myself, how I got to uh, be interested in turtles, a little bit about my background, um, and then give some kind of what I call some 30,000 foot perspective comments, uh, some comments, and uh, then we kind of talk about each species found around found in Virginia, each species of turtle. Well, I've been in the field of herpetology uh, for about 40 years. Um, I started out as a volunteer at the uh, Virginia Living Museum and Newport News um, as a uh, uh, just kind of a reptile keeper, so to speak, and worked my way up to the Virginia Living Museum and uh, was a curator of herpetology and uh, aquariums there for about 10 years or so. And then I went to work at the Virginia, I work, went to uh, Colorado, worked for Fish and Wildlife, and I've been with uh, the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fish, I should say Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources since 2005. Eastern king snake, still my favorite snake to catch. Uh, my early influences, uh, being, being uh, uh, we'll go back to the old mutual Omaha days and, of course, National Geographic. Uh, these were the two primary resources for uh, natural history type information. I can remember every Sunday evening watching Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom and then looking forward to the next issue of National Geographic. Obviously, this was long before social media. Uh, and in today's uh, social media environment, I am, I'm always amazed at the amount of information that is available to anybody in a matter of seconds. Uh, I always kind of joke around with some students uh, about how things would take weeks to get a hold of a particular article or a book, and you guys can uh, pick it up within a matter of seconds with Google. But these were my early influences with, uh, with the natural history field. And of course, I caught, grew up catching turtles down by the lake and things like that, typical of that era. Today, uh, this generation, I would say, of herpetologists, uh, or primarily uh, the millennials, I call them, um, they were hugely influenced by a new type of pop culture. 
uh, new influences in pop culture, and that was around the mid-90s. And up until the mid-90s, the field of herpetology was pretty small. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of us around, so to speak. About 95% of conservation dollars went towards uh, the furry and feathered animals, and very little attention was given to the uh, uh, reptiles and amphibians. And then there was kind of a synergistic effect kind of happened in the early 90s and in the mid 90s. One of them was the emergence of the chytrid fungus that was killing off frogs. Um, but of course, there was the crocodile hunter who came on, on the scene in around mid 90s. And love him or hate him, um, he was probably, and I still consider him today, probably the most influential individual uh, in the field of herpetology. Uh, just for the sheer fact of he created an entire culture around it almost, and it really put it on the map. And then at the same time in the mid nineties, Jurassic Park came out. And today I don't think you can go to a reptile show or go to any kind of herpetological uh, field event and somebody's going to be wearing a Jurassic Park t-shirt. Uh, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources uh, we are the largest non-federal landowner in Virginia. We manage about 43 wildlife management areas around the state uh, with more than 203,000 acres. Doesn't sound like a whole lot when you uh, compare us to some of the Western states where they're dealing with you know, millions of acres of forest service land. But the Eastern United States can, is uniquely uh, challenged in the fact that we don't have these big, huge federal properties which have their own challenges in management and conservation, but we deal a lot with uh, private landowners because most of the land in the Eastern United States is in private land. And uh, we also do a lot of management and wildlife rest and habitat restoration uh, on our WMAs. Uh, Virginia is actually quite a diverse uh, 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 species of herpetofauna. Uh, herpetofauna is the collective term for reptiles and amphibians. Uh, Virginia have nine species of lizard, 17 species of turtle, uh, five species of uh, sea turtle, 28 species of frog. And when I'm referring to species, I'm not including all the subspecies that come with it, and which I'll talk about those as well in this presentation for, for, for those turtles. And we have about 32 species of snake and 55 species of salamander. And that list of salamanders seems to grow about every few years. And in fact, we just added two or three new species over the past few years uh, here in Virginia through some genetic work um, on quite a few of the high elevation salamanders in Southwest Virginia. So working from the top and go around, some of the animals I've worked with over the um, over the years recently, uh, Scarlet King Snake, which just wasn't recently described in Virginia until 2007. Uh, it was a long time uh, misidentified as an interbreed between Scarlet Kings and milk snakes. Uh, wood turtles, hellbenders, Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog, which wasn't described in Virginia until about 2017. Uh, tiger salamanders, Cambrake rattlesnake, which is a geographic variation of timber rattlesnake, eastern spadefoot, and the eastern chicken turtle. So who doesn't really love turtles? Uh, unlike their uh, reptilian uh, cousins, uh, snakes and crocodiles, um, turtles really don't seem to uh, intimidate anybody. And there's not too many people I've ran into that are afraid of turtles on any level, except for maybe an old snapping turtle or something like that. Um, but I've been working with turtles quite a bit. I've been very fortunate to uh, have some pretty amazing uh, adventures uh, working with this group of animals. I was able to get to go to Charles Darwin Research Station in Galapagos. And uh, of course, one of my turtle, favorite ant turtles to work with are wood turtles up in the northern part of the state. Uh, globally, there's about 334 species of turtle around the world. And about half of those turtles are actually imperiled uh, with extinction primarily through habitat loss and through the illegal wildlife trade. There's about 42 species in the southeastern United States, which southeastern United States is only second to southeastern Asia, Southeast Asia in turtle diversity. And in the southeastern United States, um, there's about 57 total species of turtle in, North, in the United States. And so about 75% of them occur in the, in the southeast. 
And um, so we're an extremely diverse uh, region, both uh, within the North American continent as well as globally. So this first part of this presentation, uh, I should say the second part of this presentation, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the general ecology of, of turtles, and then I'll go into each individual turtle and just talk a little bit about each one of them and with some highlights on some of the uh, projects that we've worked on recently. Turtles, uh, a lot of folks, you know, kind of associate turtles with longevity, uh, which is true in most species. Uh, for instance, the wood turtle here on the left, uh, wood turtles are believed to eat, or definitely live more than 100 years or can live for more than 100 years. And there's some evidence that they may live up to 150, if not more than that. Uh, we found this turtle, actually, uh, somebody sent these photos to us. This was found in a remote area of Augusta County. Um, it's very worn and old, and it looks like somebody carved their initials along with the date 1913. Uh, judged by the age and the wear on this shell and this age of this turtle, uh, we uh, considered this to be a legitimate and most likely it was somebody, uh, a timber guy or somebody who's found this turtle and just randomly carved their initials in the shell. We don't obviously recommend this for people to do this, but it, but it was a very interesting to find this animal uh, that showed that this turtle at the time was over 100 years old. Now, on the flip side of that is what I call the anti-turtle. Uh, the, the eastern chicken turtle, it does just about, it's, it's just the turtle that doesn't fit the mold with other turtles. Um, at best, the eastern chicken turtle may live to 19 years. It's a very fast growing turtle. Males will sexually mature in about two years, but the maximum record um, is probably about 19 years. And that's only in the northern population. In the southern populations, they probably don't live as long because they don't hibernate. Hibernation actually extends the lifespan of some of these animals. Uh, most noticeable thing about turtles uh, is their shell and basking. Uh, quick note about their shell. The shell is actually living tissue. Uh, it's an extension of their spine and elaboration of the ribs, and it's never shed. Now they will shed sometimes the little scoop plates will peel off as they, as uh, throughout the year. Um, and there's three primary forms of shelled turtles, and those are hard shells, soft shells, and then leather bags. But the most recognizable turtle by far is the hard shell turtle. Uh, like I said, this is living tissue. And in the springtime is uh, when you'll begin to see turtles begin to bask. Uh, painted turtles seem to pop up really early. Uh, this is one of the most wide ranging vertebrates in North America are painted turtles. And they pretty much occur across the uh, northern half of the United States from coast to coast and range up into Canada. Here are some red belly cooters. Uh, Virginia is to the core of that range. It's kind of a mid Atlantic region turtle. But basking is really good, uh, has a real critical need. They don't do it, obviously, just to soak up the sun and enjoy it. Uh, it raises their body temperature, like all reptiles, to the point where they can metabolize and for activity, digest food, metabolize particular vitamins. It's also uh, used for in growth, as well as sperm and egg production. Turtles can actually overheat, so they have to bounce in and out of the water to adjust their temperature. That's why you'll see them bask quite mostly in the spring, but by the time summer rolls around, the water temperatures are warm enough where they don't have to do a whole lot of basking past uh, mid, late morning. That's why you tend to see a lot, a lot of turtles basking in large numbers in the spring, and then you don't see so much towards summer. Uh, generally, kind of diet. Uh, some turtles are herbivorous, and some are carnivorous, and some actually are omnivorous, eating a variety of things. I've even seen box turtles in the woods eating uh, carrion, like a dead bird. They'll, they'll take advantage of that. But the, but the structural difference in the two. They're herbivorous turtles, you a lot of times see these serrated jaws. Now turtles don't have teeth, but they will have a serrated jaw, and this is good for tearing fibrous plants, such as in this uh, coastal plain cooter. Those turtles that have a really sharp edged jaw, uh, that's typically uh, characteristic of a carnivorous turtle. And of course, the most notable sharp edged jawed turtle is the snapping turtle. Uh, there's sexual dimorphism in most species. Uh, these bog turtles on the upper left, the males have a noticeably larger and more thicker tail than the females. 
Uh, probably most people uh, recognize the concave uh, plastron of a male turtle. These are wood turtles. And then more flat uh, plastron or belly part of the shell uh, that is characteristic of female turtles. There's also some other sexually dimorphic uh, characteristics, uh, particularly of water turtles, aquatic turtles, which the males typically are much smaller than the females in aquatic turtles because reproduction is done in the water and it allows for males to conduct a behavior called titillating where they actually swim in front of the female and kind of invert their fingers and give this wag to the female trying to get her attention. So the males have these very elaborate claws that they do this display. While the females just have more proportionate sized claws. But as you see in these aquatic turtles, the males are much smaller than the females. And these are a pair of, looks like red belly cooters. Uh, and box turtles, um, again, the, you have a, a concave plastron and male box turtles. But in some populations of box turtles, the one here on the right, you'll have these bright red eyes, while the females typically have more brownish eyes. There's also some differences in the head shape and shell shape as well. Quite often, female turtles have more domier shells uh, to that to allow for, uh, obviously, uh, holding eggs, the capacity to hold eggs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, reproduction, depending upon the species, can uh, be done aquatically or can be done terrestrially. Uh, with wood turtles, it's almost always done aquatically with male mounts to female. Um, in this particular species, there is no behavioral display. The males are actually quite aggressive. <coughs> Excuse me. And they'll bite and, uh, uh, at the female's head and really become, uh, and that when he mounts her, he'll actually, you'll, you can actually hear him clunking the shells um, while he's trying to get her attention and be more receptive to him. Um, and then, of course, there's egg laying. All turtles lay eggs. Uh, depending upon the species of turtle, like box turtles and bog turtles, they may only lay two to four eggs. And then, of course, you have sea turtles, which could literally lay hundreds of eggs in one year but all turtles do lay eggs. Uh, there's only two species of turtle that are genetically determined uh, hatchlings. All the others are uh, temperature sex dependent, which means variations in temperature will determine whether it's a male or female turtle. And the two genetic determined turtles are wood turtles and soft shell turtles. And of course, nesting, which everybody I'm sure has encountered if they live near a body of water with turtles is nesting in their gardens and flower beds in the spring, which is quite common. And then the little hatchlings, um, they come out and they have this little egg tooth that helps them split open the egg and get and uh, emerge from the nest. And then they'll, they'll still have a little bit of yolk with them that they'll use while they'll soak, soak that up until they're ready to completely leave the nest cavity. Uh, reptiles actually uh, during the winter don't hibernate. Hibernation is something that's more of a uh, mammal thing. It's uh, really associated with mammals. Uh, uh, for turtles and other reptiles, it's called brumation. It's just basically a torpor state. It's just a state of inactivity. Unlike mammals, reptiles will not feed heavily before going into uh, turtles and other reptiles have to get uh, water. So they still have to absorb water somehow or get, get, get water somehow, unlike mammals in hibernation. Um, with uh, turtles, depending upon the species, they can hibernate terrestrially. Uh, we consider, uh, or they can hibernate in the ponds, in the bottom of streams and leaf litter beds. A lot of times they may hibernate singularly, but some species like spotted turtles and wood turtles, uh, they may hibernate communally, uh, where you may have a dozen or more turtles in the same hibernation site. And with northern diamondback terrapins, you can actually literally have hundreds of turtles in the same hibernation area. So I broke this uh, talk into three different sections of turtles, terrestrial and semi-aquatic turtles, and then we'll talk about aquatic turtles, and then marine and salt and uh, marine and brackish water turtles. Uh, by far the most recognizable turtle in Virginia is the woodland box turtle. Uh, it's also referred to as the eastern box turtle, but the woodland box turtle is actually the subspecies of box of eastern box turtle. Uh, it's found pretty much throughout the state. Uh, they emerge usually in uh, around, you'll see, depending upon what part of the state you live in, sometime around April when the 
course, it's all depends upon the weather conditions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the males often have these bright red eyes, while the females are a little bit more, more duller in color. And what's characteristic about a box turtle is their ability to uh, completely enclose their shell. Uh, so they have this hinge on the plastron right here, this white area, which allows for the front part of the plastron to completely enclose. It's quite an effective means of uh, defense against uh, predators such as a fox or something. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work so good on uh, roads against cars. And uh, of course, highways are a horrible, uh, take a horrible toll on box turtles every year. Wood turtle, uh, this is a state threatened species. It reaches the southern end of its range in uh, uh, Northern Virginia. It ranges all the way northward into uh, Canada. Um, it is uh, habitat loss, habitat degradation, and also poaching for the uh, illegal pet trade, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, has also been pro very problematic. We do a lot of work with the Smithsonian on conservation of this turtle uh, up in Northern Virginia. And as such, I thought I'd share with you a little bit of our work. Whoops, let me back up here. There we go. Uh, this is a typical wood turtle stream. Uh, this is a semi-aquatic turtle, as I mentioned uh, earlier. They hibernate in the water and they'll hang around the water from about October until late March. And then after that, April, and then throughout the summer, they're quite up in, up in the forested and uh, the floodplain areas foraging around for slugs. And they're an omnivorous turtle. They'll eat berries and just about anything that's uh, edible for them to get a hold of. But they do eat a lot of slugs and earthworms and berries. And then every fall, they go back, they, they migrate. Uh, they do a micro migration and they'll migrate back to their home stream and they'll hibernate in the bottom of streams and under cut banks. Well, what is really amazing about turtles, uh, particularly wood turtles, and I'm gonna stop this real quick. Basically this, I'm gonna describe this map. We did some uh, radio telemetry with wood turtles. We've done quite a bit of work with this particular form of radio telemetry. We had uh, GPS transmitters so we could track them uh, basically every day as they are moving around. Um, so what these two dots represent are turtles. This is a big basin valley right here. This is a mountain ridge. These are the streams coming out off the top of the mountain. This is the uh, west side of the mountain ridge and this is West Virginia. So what is amazing about these turtles is this is a 3000 foot mountain range. Doesn't sound like a lot, but keep in mind, this is a turtle doing this. So if you follow the dots, you'll see what happens when they emerge Right now, the date's around late April. So that's about the time that they would be emerging out of hibernation. And we go through May and they're kind of foraging around. And then we get into the nesting season and then away they go. And they'll move around, move around and they'll move for miles. And this one goes all the way across, across this mountain range and into West Virginia. We actually tracked one turtle one year, it moved 16 linear miles in two months. And with all this information, of course, we've uh, developed a conservation plan for this species. Another turtle that we work quite a bit with, uh, to note it just up top, this is a federally threatened turtle and a state endangered turtle, this is the bog turtle. The distribution of the bog turtle is kind of interesting. You have a northern population uh, that ranges up into New York, Massachusetts, and starts out in Maryland. Then you have a big range gap. And then you have the southern population, Virginia, North Carolina. And of the southern population, Virginia, North Carolina make up by far about 90% of that population. But they have, do have limited distribution in Virginia to a handful of counties in the southwest part of the state in the southern Blue Ridge. This is the typical habitat, and this is uh, some of my crew uh, doing bog turtle surveys. This is a little bog turtle nest. They're not the best nesters. They kind of tend to find these little clumps of grass um, in Sussex and hedges, 
and will spag them moss patches and lay their, they actually lay their eggs on the surface. They don't actually, they don't actually bury them. Uh, but they enjoy these bogs. And in Virginia, we don't really have a lot of bogs, but we have more or less like called mountain beds. And these are surface driven, uh, water charged uh, little wetlands in these valleys um, in Southwest Virginia. So this is very much a uh, habitat specialist. And a lot of our sites actually are grazed by cattle in order to control the encroachment of woody vegetation, which you don't want in these wetland areas as it begins to shade in and change the vegetation type structure. And it just doesn't make it as favorable for bog turtles. So in some areas, we actually use cattle to graze these wetlands in order to uh, keep the woody vegetation down. And we also have just submitted a bog turtle conservation plan, uh, which is in approval process right now within the agency. Spotted turtle is another one of a great con of a conservation concern in the Northeast. We've been doing quite a bit of work with this species. It's another semi-aquatic turtle. Um, you'll they'll hibernate on the on land. I've seen them in somewhat wetter areas. Um, they uh, spend a lot of their time in uh, backwater swamps and set in the eastern part of this uh, of Virginia, particularly in the southeast part. This is not a what you would call a basking turtle in the sense of uh, it, they bask quite a bit in the late winter when they first emerge. they early. They get early. They get started early. Uh, you can find these turtles out in February when the temperatures start to get into the fifties. You'll start to see them basking on logs. They inhabit a lot of black water, kind of a cypress gum swamps, sinkholes, stuff like that. You will not see this turtle in big reservoirs and lakes and ponds uh, where you would typically find uh, painted turtles and cooters and stuff like that. Uh, we've done, right now we're in the middle of a huge uh, project with 13 other states. Uh, assessing the status and the, developing the conservation initiative uh, for this species. Poaching has been one of the big problems. Uh, these turtles have been hit really hard by poachers to meet the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, that's a good picture down here of a typical bog turtle habitat gum swamp. Southeastern mud turtle is perhaps one of the most common turtles in uh, southeastern United States. Uh, on a rainy night during the summer, you can probably drive around roads, around uh, swamps and other wet areas, and you'll see these turtles out crawling around all over the place. It's a very common turtle. Uh, their success is that they're kind of a generalist, um, have a different variety of different kind of uh, uh, habitats. But in southern parts of their range, they'll actually nest two to three times a year. So they have a really good reproductive output compared to other turtles which is good when you consider that probably 90 plus percent of their eggs and hatchlings won't make it through the first year. But turtles, in that sense, that's why they live so long. Because the model for a turtle is, if a turtle has one of its offspring become a reproductive adult, then it's considered a successful turtle. And turtles don't senesce, they'll continue to reproduce it throughout their entire lives. So if a box turtle lives to 150 years old and has a couple of its offspring, breeding, then it'll be a considered a successful turtle. However, one of the challenges is too in their reproduction is that quite often turtles have delayed sexual maturity where they may go 10 to 12 years before reaching a reproductive age. Striped mud turtle reaches the northern end of its range in southeastern Virginia. It's a coastal plain species. What's it? it looks a lot like the uh, southeastern mud turtle, but one noticeable difference is the stripes on the head. Now, when you go in the southern, more southern areas like Georgia and into Florida, they have very distinctive stripes on their shell. But in the northern population, they, these stripes are vague at best to be visible. Um, but they're a fairly common turtle when you get where you find them in the southeastern part. And they typically you'll find this turtle or you'll find the southeastern muds. Usually you don't find an equal number of them cohabitating the same area. Chicken turtle, uh, it's one of my favorite turtles. I've done quite a bit of work on this turtle. It reaches, this is Southeast Virginia, is the southern, as the northern extent of its range. We only have two disjunct populations, one in Isle of Wight County on a private farm and another population at 
uh, First Landing State Park in Virginia Beach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a sexually, the male sexually mature in about two years, but they only live for about 20 years. Females are much larger than the males. Um, and they get this, their name, even though they have this chicken-like neck, which they kind of shoot out to grab, uh, primarily they feed on odinates, uh, dragonfly, dragonfly larvae. Uh, they're very much habitat specialists. You only will find them like sinkholes in Carolina bays. You'll never find them in big reservoirs and lakes and ponds. They really like those fishless type ponds. Um, but they get their name um, actually because of uh, old 1800s, around 1870s, there was a written account about turtles, uh, which ones were the tastiest. And the written account actually mentions that this was the most palatable of turtles and it tasted much like chicken. So yes, supposedly chicken turtles do taste like chicken. And this is the typical chicken turtle uh, habitat. This is actually a sinkhole known as the cat ponds. Um, and so you'll never use it. And there are other turtles in here, but this is the typical kind of isolated wetland uh, habitat that they inhabit. Freshwater turtles. These are turtles that uh, will uh, spend their entire lives basically both hibernating in their activity period during the summer uh, in the water. Um, but the only time they'll usually come up on land is to lay eggs. Pond slider. Uh, we have two subspecies of pond slider, one that occurs in the southeastern part of the state, and that's the yellow belly slider. And then we have the Cumberland slider, which occurs down in the uh, southwestern part of the state. Now, what's interesting about this turtle and one other turtle, too, the northern red belly cooter, that the the males will actually uh, quite often melanize as they get older and they turn all black like this and lose their color and pattern. And it's one of the big mysteries in nature because nobody's really sure what, what advantage this gives this turt for males to turn black like this. Uh, typically, they're, when they're not quite that old, they have this more traditional pattern. Um, so it's quite a, it's still a big mystery as to why, why this, uh, uh, be, uh, this change occurs. Uh, river cooters, we have, two, so we have two species of river cooter. We have the eastern river cooter, which occurs around right around the fall line of Virginia, which is around Interstate 95. It's a geographical feature separating the coastal plain from the Piedmont. So west of the um, fall line, you will find river cooters. And then the southeastern region of the state, again, this is another trail that reaches the northern end of their range in southeast Virginia you will get what is called the uh, coastal plain coot. These are uh, uh, herbivorous turtles. Uh, another herbivorous turtle is the uh, northern red belly cooter. Virginia is the core of its range, the mid-Atlantic region's turtle. Uh, most of it uh, occurs if its range of Virginia is in the coastal plain. It's quite common turtle. I, I get them coming up in my backyard here in Williamsburg. Uh, off of the local creek, nesting in my backyard every year. Uh, they have these serrated upper cusps, which uh, is indi indicative of an herbivorous turtle um, uh, for tearing uh, fibrous material. Um, river cruders, uh, they do have that same crushing, but they're kind of omnivorous, but they'll primarily eat a lot of insects and uh, snails, but they will take some vegetation. But, but the river cooter is definitely a more herbivorous turtle. <clears throat> Eastern painted turtle um, is probably one of the most common turtles you'll encounter. Huge numbers in small bodies of water. They literally inhabit every permanent and semi-permanent body of water throughout Virginia, except for in some areas in southeast, southwest Virginia. Um, they range across the northern United States from coast to coast and into Canada. I believe it's one of the most wide ranging vertebrates in North America. Very common turtle, or quite a beautiful turtle too. Uh, northern map turtle uh, that only in Virginia only occurs in the Tennessee watershed in Southwest Virginia. Uh, they have these notable uh, mandibles or jaws uh, for crushing uh, 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 snails and stuff like that that they forage on in these streams uh, down southwest Virginia. 
uh, females are much larger than the males. And of course, the snapping turtle, which everybody's familiar with. This is Virginia's largest turtle. Uh, they get up to about 60 pounds at best. Uh, it's the largest one I've seen recorded. Uh, quite a common, inhabits all different kinds of wetlands throughout, the, throughout, the, uh, throughout Virginia. Uh, this picture down here on the uh, bottom, I actually caught this leucistic, tur this leucistic snapping turtle. Uh, it lacks the uh, dark pigment. Um, it's just a genetic glitch, nothing, nothing that'll cause it any problems. Uh, but it was quite a uh, interesting uh, capture when we were doing work down in uh, Southwest Virginia. Eastern musk turtle, another small turtle, very common in the coastal plain, found, found primarily found throughout the state, uh, quite abundant in the coastal plain. Uh, they're called musk turtle because they actually, if you catch one, you'll, you'll know, you'll smell them. They're a little stinky. Uh, they have this very reduced uh, plastron, these fleshy areas, fleshy areas in between. And the mountains, uh, quite often the fleshy areas look very pink because they're probably mo very uh, vascularized uh, for gas exchange. It's a small turtle, but very common. Striped neck musk turtle, it's another type of musk turtle, but this one's only found in the southwestern part of the state. And this is a real oddball. Uh, this is the one soft shell turtle we have. That's the Eastern Spiny soft shell. And, and this is, uh, they don't really have a hard, they don't have a hard shell. They don't have scoots. Uh, it's a genetically sex determined turtle. They don't rely upon uh, temperature, uh, temperature to determine the hatchlings. Um, they have this kind of snorkel pig face that they kind of will swim around and just stick their noses up to breathe. Um, but if you ever catch one accidentally fishing, uh, be wary. They have very sharp claws and they have very sharp and powerful jaws. And the last group of turtles I'll talk about are the brackish water and marine turtles. <clears throat> and I will disclaimer myself, I am not a sea turtle expert, so I'll talk a little bit about sea turtles in general, but um, I'm not going to go into great detail with them. Uh, the northern diamondback terrapin um, is the only uh, truly estuarine turtle. They live in brackish water. They live around the Bay Islands and the seaside islands of the eastern shore. Um, it's the only, as I said, it's the only estuarine turtle we have. Um, they have very females get much larger than the males, and they all have the very usually very powerful, and notable jaws uh, for eating periwinkles. Those are the little snails you'll see going up and down the. Uh, the uh, grass there in the marine areas and along the uh, barrier islands. As I mentioned earlier about brumation with turtles and how they communally will uh, brumate together. This was a recent photo taken this past spring. All of these little things, these are all turtles. This was the mass emergence of diamondback terrapin, literally hundreds of them coming out of a communal hibernation area. This is also what made them very vulnerable to commercial harvest a long time ago when there used to be a big demand for uh, terrapin soup. One of the big threats to this turtle, to this species um, that we're working with is uh, crab pots mortality. Uh, this was a, what is called a derelict or a ghost crab pot. It's basically lost. It was lost during a storm or abandoned. Um, but these crab pots will continuously catch uh, accidentally or in, unintentionally catch turtles as they are just curious animals to swim into things. And this particular crab pot had over 50 dead turtles in it. Uh, there are literally thousands of these crab pots scattered across the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. And we're working on turtle excluder devices right now uh, uh, to see if we can reduce that mortality in crabbing. And these are quite a beautiful turtle. You can see they're also quite popular in, uh, in the illegal pet trade for poachers to go after. The little male there on the left, really large feet for uh, excellent swimmers. Loggerhead sea turtle. Uh, this is the primary sea turtle we get in uh, uh, Virginia. Uh, vast majority of the turtles, sea turtles that occur here are loggerheads. Uh, we don't get the huge giant ones unless if they're during the nesting season. 
Uh, typically, we have uh, sub adults uh, tend to forage around the bay uh, that are over 15 years old, uh, but they're not quite as big as the, uh, the fully adult turtles. Uh, they're feeding mostly on whelks and uh, uh, around the bay. You can get a, probably a, eight or 10 nests a year occur down in the Sandbridge area and along the uh, uh, Falls Cape State Park area. Kent's Ridley Sea Turtle. Uh, this is one that we've just recently started getting uh, nesting events occurring uh, here just a few years ago in 2014, we had a nesting event at uh, Falls Cape State Park, uh, which was the first time this turtle's ever been documented nesting in the state. And of course, there is the Goliath of all turtles, and that is the leatherback sea turtle. A uh, leatherback sea turtle can get over 10 feet in length, and they can grow up to over 2,000 pounds. Uh, they prime, almost exclusively feed on jellyfish. So they have their throats and their mouths are lined with these fleshy uh, papilla, uh, which help kind of grip jellyfish and, and, get, and for them to swallow the jellyfish. Uh, it's quite, it looks like a looks like the mouth out of some kind of Star Wars movie. Um, what's amazing about these turtles is that be, they have the ability to uh, dive up to four thousand feet in depth, and they can do so in part because of the flexibility of their carapace uh, can contract and expand. And then green sea turtle. Uh, this is another one we just recently got our first nesting event here se uh, several years ago. Our first noted, uh, first documented nesting event. They're a rare visitor, but a few of them do show up every year. Uh, this juvenile, we actually captured in the at the mouth of the Chickahominy River accidentally while doing a snapping turtle uh, project in, Ch in uh, Charles City. Uh, it, was, it was in late August, and the folks at the Virginia Marine Science Museum said this is the furthest inland they'd ever seen a turtle. But, you know, strange things happen. And then, of course, there's the Atlantic hawksbill sea turtle, which is probably one of the most beautiful turtle, sea turtles. Unfortunately, that gorgeous uh, turtle shell, no, uh, characteristic turtle shell turtle, uh, is also what made them very popular for a harvest uh, for a lot of different uh, jewelry and a variety of different uh, things. Um, we have a few invasive uh, turtles. Uh, we have a, a species of map turtle, and we have some non-native soft shells in certain areas, but by far the most notable invasive turtle is the red-eared slider. Um, it's a subspecies of the pond slider. It's primarily found in the lower Mississippi River Valley, but this was turtle was sold by the tens of millions back in the 60s and 70s. And for those of you that are a little bit longer in the tooth, so to speak, probably bought one of these back in the day, along with the little plastic bowl and plastic palm tree uh, that you had. But these turtles were dumped all over the place because turtles tend to have a uh, shelf life as far as being pets. And then people tend to get bored with them and uh, dump them. Uh, we have a lot of different conservation threats with turtles. Uh, this was an illegal poaching top left uh, guy poaching wood turtles out of West Virginia that we, kept, that we caught in Virginia. Uh, shrimp trawlers uh, accidentally bycatch sea turtles. Um, illegal turtles being sold in Virginia. These are red and slider hatchlings. Overabundance of predators such as raccoons are devastating on a lot of areas, particularly on the barrier islands where diamondback terrapins nest. Overharvest for the commercial food trade, snapping turtles. And of course, roads and highways are devastating on turtles. This chicken turtle here was fortunate enough to survive its injury. Uh, there's a lot of collaborations going on to combat the illegal turtle trade. I can do an entire presentation on the internal, illegal turtle trade in and of itself. But here's some notable recent operations uh, involving uh, uh, 3,500 illegally uh, harvested uh, diamondback terrapins getting ready to go to the pet trade. Box turtles are hugely popular overseas as pets. Uh, this top left was a huge confiscation of uh, hundreds of mud turtles and a variety of other turtles out in Florida. And it's a massive uh, issue with this turtle uh, trade. Uh, turtles probably in and of themselves are the most illegally trafficked major group of, of vertebrates in the world. 
So how it helps, can you help conserve turtles? They can do a lot of different things. Uh, you can just simply leave them be, don't take them home as pets, don't relocate them. If you see one crossing the road, stop if you can safely, move it off to the side of the direction it was heading, or if that's not in a good direction, then head it back in the direction it came from, if that's a safer direction. Uh, of course, don't discard fish and lime trash, create turtle friendly areas, void moaning, just a lot of the usual things that are a lot of good for a lot of different animals. So it's not just good for turtles. And if you want to learn more about turtles, we actually have a guide to the turtles of Virginia uh, that you can purchase to learn a lot more. And with that, I will say that was the end. Um, I know that's kind of a, uh, what I call a fire hose presentation with a lot of information, but I wanted to leave a few minutes here at the end uh, for folks that might have very specific questions or anything like that. So with that, I will stop and turn it back over. I know it's a lot of information, really, really fast. <laughs> that was wonderful, JD. We do have um, Cheryl in the chat asked, do turtles make sounds? Actually, for a long time, that's a great question. And unfortunately, because of my timelines, I didn't have a lot of time to go into the uh, anatomy of turtles, but uh, turtles are referred to as anapsids. Uh, humans are called diapsid. They have two openings uh, for ears. Uh, but turtle skulls, if you look at a turtle skull, they have no openings for ears. But for a long time, they thought that turtles didn't communicate or make sounds or anything. But that theory, but that dogma has actually changed quite a bit. And they're actually seeing communication underwater between certain species of turtle in South America. And there's actually been documentation of hatchling turtles peeping kind of like chicks in the nest underground prior to emerging. So there's a lot, so social behavior in reptiles is probably the most poorly studied aspect of uh, life history of reptiles, particularly with turtles. So we have a few more questions in the chat too. Um, do turtles prefer to maintain their personal space or be near other turtles? Or does it depend on the type? Depends upon the species. Some of them are really, they aggregate, uh, I call it, you know, springtime, you'll see them piled three high on a log. Uh, they'll be bumping each other off. The big ones, of course, bump the little ones off and then they fight over the, the best. They always fight over the best and optimal basking sites, but the biggest turtles always went out. Um, and then there are turtles that will communally hibernate together, as like I mentioned several species do. Um, which is another big question mark. We're not sure why they communally hibernate, particularly species like wood turtle, where there's plenty of good hibernation sites in a particular stream, but they all seem to aggregate in one spot. Um, so it depends upon the species, whether if, they, whether if they're gregarious or not. Box turtles, uh, definitely not. You're, you're not gonna see a bunch of box turtles together. <laughs> So I guess I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question to that. Are they territorial then? They'll have territories, but they won't defend territories. Now in snapping turtles, we've never seen any territorial fights and we've done some radio telemetry and it will show their activity ranges between turtles will overlap. Um, now they may chase off, there may be some to territorial defense in snapping turtles or something like that, but they usually tend to partition themselves like the smaller ones will live in the more shallow grassier areas while the bigger ones will occupy the more main channels and the the deeper water areas yeah all right um megan asks is there an organization in virginia which uh, or that offers visitor opportunities to watch sea turtle eggs hatch you would have to contact the virginia marine science museum in virginia beach they are the pretty much the point uh, point of contact for anything sea turtle in Virginia. And you'd have to get a hold of, talk to somebody down there. But I don't know whether if they have anything where you can actually watch them emerge, but they do have volunteer programs where they have a uh, sea turtle watch, where they basically wait for them to hatch out and may, may assist. I'm not really familiar with the sea turtle stuff, but if you're interested more in sea turtles, particularly in Virginia, contact the Virginia Marine Science Museum. 
Okay, now Arva asks, what efforts do you do to combat the red-eared slider population in contained ponds, like the population uh, in Alexandria's Ben Bredman Park? Yeah, unfortunately the genie is out of the bottle. Um, those turtles are here to stay. Uh, they're they're, they're kind of like sparrows. Uh, there's not much you can do. They're just too, they're just too well established. Um, and some of the ponds are huge numbers. Um, fortunately, most of the places they occupy are created habitats, like uh, you know reservoirs or ponds and lakes. And remember now, Virginia only has two naturally occurring lakes. That's Lake Drummond in Smith Mountain and uh, 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 oh, Mountain Lake, Mountain Lake up in Giles County. Those are the only two naturally occurring lakes. So all the other lakes you see are created bodies of water in Virginia. Um, and the red-eared sliders really love those. But anything that we're actively doing, like removing now, but we have recently banned the possession of red-eared sliders, and you can't import, export, or anything with them anymore. So you can't do anything with them. Unfortunately, it's it, it's they're here to stay. Yeah. Um, the musk turtles. You mentioned that they smell. Do yeah. they smell as defense mechanism? I can't answer that because I don't know, and I don't know if anybody knows. <laughs> um, but when you pick them up, you will notice there's a little bit of an aroma that comes off of them. Um, and it may be some kind of, they live in very dark bracket, you know, very dark tannin water typically, but you'll find them up in mountain streams. And they may use the musk as some kind of ability to, uh, you know, they have an incredible oil factory system. So I suspect the musk is some way for them to communicate and find each other, males find females, that kind of thing. Uh, I suspect there's gotta be some functionality to it, perhaps that way, or it may be a defensive mechanism that an animal comes across it and smells it and it smells like it's you know rotten, so that they leave it alone. <laughs> uh, I suspect that's probably the latter is probably the thing because they do get up on land, but I, I'm not really sure why they have that musky smell. That's fair. Um, Megan asks, are there any turtles that do make res uh, responsible pets or that you would recommend? Um, I always recommend captive bred. Never buy turtles that are wild caught. Don't buy turtles from people that are online uh, unless they're a reputable breeder or something like that. Do your research and your homework for turtles. Um, know all the conditions you need for housing, diet, lighting is extremely important because these guys do a lot of metabolism through basking. So you need really appropriate lighting for them or you will have serious health issues with them. Um, and then also the longevity. Uh, realize that, you know, pets are for keeps. Uh, it's a lifetime commitment and know how long your turtle can live. And as I mentioned with box turtles, uh, you know, that's a hundred plus years. So they're going to outlive your kids and your grandkids <laughs> probably. And those are often referred to as what we call will pets, where you have to will that animal to somebody. Um, but I go to a reputable pet store and uh, talk to them about, you know, captive bred turtles and what their lifespan is, but then go back and do your own research and figure out uh, exactly what best suits your needs. And then Lynn asks, does JD have a favorite folktale or, or tale about turtles versus, versus hares? <laughs> or versus hares. <laughs> Uh, oh man, um, I got all kinds of turtle stories. Um, I always laugh at some of the turtles that people think turtles are slow. Turtles are fast. Um, they're, I mean, box turtles, of course. I mean, you see a box turtle get up and start to kind of scurry, but river cooters crossing a road and you get out and you stop and you think you're trying to help them and they just take off and they're basically across the road before you can get to them. Um, so they move pretty quick, but uh, I've got. I have to say, I'll go back to the sea turtle one. That was kind of pretty funny um, because the guy that was the, doing the project was a post, was a doctoral student at BCU and he was looking at snapping turtle populations uh, and harvest. And uh, he calls me up and I'm heading down the road. He calls me up and says, hey, we caught a sea turtle in one of our traps. I'm like, my first response is, where are you guys trapping? And I was like, where, did you, where you would catch a sea turtle? And I'm like, 
He's like, we're at Morris Creek off of Chickahominy. And I'm like, are you sure you didn't catch a map turtle or something else? Blah, blah, blah. You know, thinking maybe somebody dumped their pet. And he's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a doctoral student. I know what a turtle, sea turtle looks like. <laughs> so I'm like going, all right, I'll drive down there, but it better not be somebody's stupid map turtle they dropped off of the creek. And sure enough, there's a green sea turtle in Morris Creek. <laughs> so... Good I, you know, it's, there's, that's one thing I love about this job is the, the sense of discovery and the new kind of weird things that kind of just pop up when you think you know everything. But I always say never say never. Something can always happen you wouldn't think it happened. That's so true. Now, I'm sorry if I missed anyone in the chat. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, ask a question as well. I'm I'm so thankful for this um, presentation. This is very great. Thank you, JD. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, and like I said, I hope I didn't, uh, you know, uh, shotgun that too fast. But it's a lot of information. It's a big group of animals. It's a lot of really cool, interesting anecdotes that you can go off on and basically talk about one species for 45 minutes almost. Uh, that's that's not a problem, but. Yeah, it's a cool group of animals, but they definitely need a lot of help in uh, their conservation. Well, thank you for your time and your expertise. Um, I hope everyone gets a chance to go see the, the Naked in the Newt art exhibit at the gallery or online. Um, that website again is delrayartisans.org. And um, uh, appreciate you attending tonight and learning more about turtles. All right, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye.